Hey guys, welcome back to As A Man Thinketh on Yonasa TV. So today I'm gonna to talk about something that is really disturbing. And what makes this so disturbing is that the smallest county in Colorado, Denver County, can make decisions with a handful of voters that could have massive impacts on all of you and, and, and a large group of small family farms. They could literally shut down small family farms throughout a, a wide region um, just from one policy that they've decided to put on their ballot. Uh, so let's talk about this. There's actually two policies. Uh, it's blatantly clear that what they're doing here is a land grab to build an inclusive city. I kid you not. They're going to destroy people's livelihoods and grab land cheaply to build an inclusive city that they're pitching as affordable housing, but as we know, these mixed use developments are not affordable. I used to work in the industry. I can tell you, you'll pay a premium to move into these residences that they build in their place. You should be able to follow these stories and see that there is money at work that has invested interests in these things. And that these groups are just simply being used as ponzies, pawns to, to fulfill their agenda. And you can get that with this story, and that's what makes it so fascinating. You can really see through this example how this all plays out. So before I get into today's video, I wanted to go back and address a few things on my video about Oregon. Um, number one, about three to four days after we published the video on some of the issues in Oregon, the state of Oregon rescinded its uh, CAFO definition, or at least rescinded its... Um, enforcement of that decision to give them time to reevaluate. Um, the lawsuit against the state of Oregon, which is being put forward by the Institute for Justice, is going to continue. According to the Institute for Justice, while we are pleased that the Department of Agriculture has decided to hold off on enforcing these regulations through the course of the litigation, we are continuing to fight to ensure that small dairies have freedom to continue operating free of needless regulations. Treating small dairies like their clients as though they are hundreds of times bigger is more than just bad policy, it's unconstitutional. And you see this a lot, actually. You see a lot of these policies that are impact, that, that are put in place for big ag uh, being forced upon small ag, and, and most of the time it, it forces small ag out of out of business. The state of Oregon is claiming that um, that particular CAFO policy was was put forward because of the dairy industry. They had pressure on them to put that out there. Guys, you can ask most of those big dairy farmers; they do not care about the small dairy farmer with two to three cows in their field that are selling raw milk somewhere, okay? Um, they, they, they don't. The, if you wanna know who the big dairy industry is, it's our Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, was the CEO of Dairy Export Council, and he's the highest paid employee, or was the highest paid employee of Dairy Management, Inc. I do know that some of our productions that we've put together over the years, one of them uh, we were hoping to get funded by a group in uh, St. Louis. And that group called us up after several conversations and said that they couldn't fund us because they were funded by Cargill and uh, another big ag group. And they were afraid that our representation of small farmers would be damaging to their reputation. So it does happen, I mean, it does happen, but the big ag groups, what, they, what you're talking about when you get into that, in the industrial complex, is there are a few people at the top that want to consolidate so that they have better control over the entire industry. But it is not the industry itself, and I don't think it's fair to put that on big dairy farmers just because they have a lot of cows. It's not coming from them. They don't feel threatened by the little guy, trust me. It's more or less a way of controlling the industry, and that's what they wanted to do here. Now, the other thing that I talked about in the Oregon video that I have not seen or heard of a solution for was the shutting down of market gardeners. And basically what they were saying was that these small market gardeners are operating a commercial business, which is true. They're selling food to their neighbors, to their neighborhood. They're providing their community through their efforts 
um, with fresh, affordable food, and they're getting compensated for those efforts. I mean, I had one guy on here who was like, well, that's what you get for profiting off of the people's water. Um, now, if you're a commercial business in the state of Oregon, they've had these you know, water rights laws in place since 1909, I get all that. But they do have an exemption for commercial businesses up to 5,000 gallons per day. And some of these market gardeners, a lot of them are using much less than that per day. They're, they're, they're using more like 1,500 gallons per day. But the state of Oregon decided that they wanted to say, well, you know, if you're a commercial user, it doesn't include irrigation. And so you can't irrigate your crops with the people's water of Oregon. And so they've basically been shutting these small farmers, small businesses down. I think it's an egregious overreach. I think that um, what they're doing is harmful to the agricultural community, especially to the market gardeners, the people who are supplying fresh produce to the people in their area. That has not been resolved to my knowledge. And you know, I don't know what anybody is doing about it. I know that a lot of people were focused on the, the way that CAFO was worded, and that is a, a complete overreach as well, but I hope more people pay attention to what's going on there with the water rights and these small market gardeners. They should not be classified in the same way that they're classifying these other groups. And it's intentional. Look, all of this is intentional. You don't implement these policies and follow through on them and then say, oh, well, that was a, that was a mistaken wording. It's intentional, they're doing it on purpose. On that video, and this is going to lead me down the whole of what's happening now in Colorado because um, I find all of this interesting and I think it is all connected in, in many ways. But on that video, somebody asked me, you know, okay, we've made progress with, with the CAFO, should we also be deregulating big ag? And I think that that's a double-edged sword. Um, and I've had a lot of conversations with people on our channel over the years, a lot of people with different political beliefs than I have over years. I mean, if I were to come out and say, you know, what I think, I think that we're completely overregulated in many ways. I think that part of the reason why you have such consolidation in the meat industry and you only have a few major producers is because of the overregulation of, of meat and, and what we can do to sell it. Um, I think that in many cases, and, and you know, in a lot of the conversations that we've had, there are necessary regulations in place especially when you're processing thousands of animals a day to make sure that the, the product coming out the other side is a safe product. I agree with that. Um, but I also think that the way that regulations often work is that they make it nearly impossible for the small guys to compete. If you're only processing a few hundred animals a day, you shouldn't have to abide by the same regulations as somebody who's processing thousands of animals a day. Um, a lot of times when these policies are put into place is not hard for big ag to adjust, but it's very hard for the smaller farmers to adjust. Here's an example of this. Proposition 12 in California was pitched to people in part saying, look, this bill is going to help the small farmer because they'll be able to sell their pigs to the state of California because California won't accept pigs from CAFOs. That's, that's a wrong perspective to have about it and it's not how things have worked out. What has happened because of Proposition 12 in California is that they saw a 41% price increase on pork tenderloins and, and pork in general is way up in California because you know, they, they basically have cut off a significant amount of pork coming into their state. And their state, the state of California, used to consume over 10% 10% of the nation's pork meat. Um, now it's less than 7%. There's been a substantial decrease in the amount of pork going into California because of Proposition 12. So what then ends up happening, and this is actually what ends up happening, is you have this kind of down the line impact where you've got an oversupply in pork uh, for the rest of the market. So the prices of pork drop down and when those prices drop down, the independent farmer's margins get cut and he can't compete with the big ag. And so what ends up happening is you end up seeing a lot of these small farmers go out of business. Eventually the prices may adjust, but in the meantime, especially you know, since Smithfield has been um, uh, canceling operations in several states, but uh, you know, Smithfield is a processor they're not the grower. The farmers themselves are the growers. They contract with Smithfield. And so those farmers will ultimately have to find a new place for their, 
their pigs to go or they will go out of business. Um, but as, as time progresses, I'm sure the environment will change. But in the meantime, a small farmer has a harder time making it through those, those price changes. And unfortunately, you know, the, Proposition 12, we're just starting to see the cascading effects of how that actually impacts people across our country. One legislation in one state is having an industry-wide impact uh, across our country. It's, it's pr truly pretty amazing. But what is even more amazing is this, um, this law that is up for the vote by the people of Denver, the city of Denver, county of Denver, uh, in the 2024 election cycle. It's a citizen's um, legislation that's been put forward to ban the sale of fur and, and of new fur within the city. I mean, old fur is okay if you have a mink coat and you wanna put it in a, you know, a store somewhere, you can do that. But they're banning the sale of new fur and they're also trying to uh, ban slaughterhouses from operating in the city. It's highly unconstitutional. It probably would be fought on a constitutional basis because you can't walk in and say to somebody, you've been operating here for 70 years and now we're shutting you down. The people who are impacted the most by this are actually sheep farmers. And that's where this all gets very interesting. And because the largest fur uh, trader or the largest fur producer in that area happens to be a producer of sheepskins, you know, sheepskins for moccasins, whatever it is that you want. They, 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 they take the byproduct of sheep processing and use it for uh, people's clothing. We want to use as much of the animals as possible. That also drives the value of the animal for the farmers, it gives the farmers a, high, a better more solid income to be able to raise the animals properly. It all feeds into the system. And if you watch our bison documentary, it goes even further than that. It, it, the, the income from, you know, the byproducts and the meat of bison actually feeds all the way back into the conservation of bison. Uh, and in many aspects, it even helps with the Native American tribes acquire more bison. So um, the, the impacts of these, these businesses are extremely important all the way through the family farms that raise these sheep and so on. So this ban would eliminate fur and it would eliminate, you know, slaughter. It would make slaughtering within the city of Denver or, or county of Denver illegal. Superior Foods is the big slaughterhouse in this area that they're targeting. And they're specifically targeting Superior Foods for a reason. Superior Foods sits within the blue Denver, the, the blueprint Denver um, mixed use plan that they came back, they came out with back in 2002. Uh, it was um, finalized again, I think in 2019. It's a 20 year plan to build an inclusive city within this area, okay? But they have a problem. There's a slaughterhouse there. So what did they do? They go out, they find an advocacy group to put this bill forward so that they can basically get a land grab on the slaughterhouse and the developers can build their high-end mixed-use developments. And real estate, they want you to believe that this area is deprived, real estate values are dropping, but in reality, according to the Denver Post, this particular area, even, even with some of the issues going on with it, property values have been going up. So um, what I think this is, is it's, it, it sounds pretty blatant. The more you get into it and the more you read these things, it's pretty blatant that this is a land grab. And it's a land grab that unfortunately is going to impact a lot of family farmers. Okay, so they say that there's a substantial demand for Globeville for affordable housing, grocery stores, and community spaces, including retail. Blueprint Denver designates the area of the slaughterhouse to become a mixed use community center by 2040. Guess what guys, we're evicting you from your private property. So if a ban on slaughterhouses is passed in 2024, there is a potential that the land could be converted to more community friendly use. I haven't heard any arguments against this particular bill. And I think it's important when you read through this to understand what the facts are and where there might be some misrepresentations to get people to vote in favor of this thing. Um, education is, is extremely important. Understanding the overall impacts is extremely important. I realize that slaughterhouses aren't a pretty subject, but I also know that these animals do a lot for our environment. These, these family farms do a lot for our communities. And eventually, 
you know, the animals do have to end up going to a slaughterhouse. And so I also want to say it before I really dig into this video, Superior Farms did face some humane violations back in 2019. And they have um, cleaned up their act, they've brought more people in for oversight, um, and they, they took they took that situation very seriously. I think within every industry, there's gonna be some bad actors. I think there are going to be some, some bad actors that might be employees, whatever it is. And this is a case where, you know, you have a regulatory body that can come in and say, okay, this is what needs to be done to fix this issue and let's move forward. And that's what happened with Superior Farms back in 2019. So they don't have the, the best history as far as that is concerned, but they have made improvements. And like I said, the, the slaughterhouses, the, the end game for a lot of animals is not a pretty subject to talk about, but it's also, it's a part of it. And, and if, we, if we're not going to allow people to harvest animals and sell directly to the consumer, then we're going to, ha we're going to have big slaughterhouses. And those big slaughterhouses, when they have that many animals, 500,000 lambs going through them a year, they're gonna have issues every now and then. I mean, that's the reality of it. You wanna change the system instead of going after our food supply, why don't you look at ways of expanding our way of selling direct from farm to consumer. So one of the misrepresentations that they put out there is that they say it's no accident that the slaughterhouse is located in Gloville, a historically immigrant and predominantly Latino neighborhood that has faced severe industrial pollution and unequal city planning. So they're trying to say that this slaughterhouse was specifically put here because it's a Latino neighborhood and, and, and we're treating them unfairly. But the reality is, is that the slaughterhouse has been there for 70 years. A lot of the people who live in these neighborhoods, who have moved to those neighborhoods over the years, have moved there because of the jobs that places like the slaughterhouse have provided to them. Then they get into the workers themselves. Okay, well, what's gonna happen to all these displaced workers in the community that they're trying to tear down and rebuild? right? Well, they're going to retrain them. They're forgetting that Superior Farms is owned by the employees. So what they're doing is they're actually destroying the equity that these people have in Superior Farms by destroying Superior Farms. They're taking away their personal prosperity, and then they're pitching them on the voters as the victims. Specifically, it says working in a slaughterhouse is one of the most dangerous jobs in America, and many who work there feel they have no other choice. The proposed legislation includes a provision that the city prioritize affected workers in its employment and assistance programs with support from Denver's Climate Protection Fund to transition to better jobs. Through these resources, slaughterhouse workers will have access to training programs to help them move into green industries. But they don't stop there because they want you to believe that the farmers being impacted by this are bad people as well. Bad people who are also polluting the environment. It's no secret that industrial animal farming is a top contributor to climate change, but it is also has a huge impact on the environment of the surrounding community. They really don't want you to see these farms for what they are. They talk about the sheep farmers as industrial farmers. They use a lot of statistics talking about how many animals are raised in confined animal uh, feeding operations across the United States that go into our meat supply. But yet they're attacking a slaughterhouse for sheep. And I don't know how many of you know much about sheep, but most sheep are raised on pasture. Very few sheep are actually raised in a CAFO. It's not that common and, and it's rare when it actually happens, but most sheep are raised on pasture. And what they don't want you to know is that Superior Foods is an employee owned business and they, they work with family farms across the nation. They have, um, they, they have a slaughterhouse and, and, and facilities in California. They have facilities in Colorado. And hundreds of farmers rely on their operations to be able to bring their meat to market because we're not allowed to sell directly to the consumer, right? We have to bring it through these large processing facilities so that we can make sure that everything is humanely done and, and that we can make sure everything is clean. So when, they're, when we're attacking superior foods. We're attacking an employee-owned company and their entire supply chain are small family farms. And, and all of those family farms need them in order to stay in business. They would all go out of business. 
Um, and so they don't want you to see how these small family farms raise their sheep. They don't want you to see that side of this story. What they want you to hear is what they're telling you, that these are industrial farms. They are exploiting animals. They are harmful to the environment. The entire animal agriculture impact on climate change debate is one that has been debunked numerous times before. Um, but it's, it's the narrative that's been put out there over and over again. And there's, when it comes to our environment, you know, and, and the impact that these animals have on our environment, we live in an ecosystem that has evolved over, over thousands of years with ungulates, large ruminant ungulates that produce CO2 and methane and, and their hooves and, and everything else, they, they built our ecosystem. The, our entire ecology was built that way. And because it was built that way, it actually depends on these animals. There are places in the front range of Colorado that would become desert wastelands if they did not have ruminants out there to break down the old vegetation and replenish the soil. It just wouldn't happen. There's no moisture. There's not enough of it. It would cause what we call desertification. But regardless of those facts, regardless of those things that have been proven true, they go on. Moving towards a more sustainable system of food production that doesn't involve the housing, feeding, and slaughter of around 90 billion farmed animals per year. Yes, they grow up on farms and ranches. Would reduce the extremely high levels of greenhouse gas emissions. If you look at the actual percentage of, of uh, CO2 emissions coming from agriculture, it's very small. It wouldn't make a difference. Deforestation and water consumption. Again, when we're talking about the area that would be impacted by these sheep farmers, it's not forest lands. It's, it's mainly grasslands or it's, you know, rocky mountain lands. And so you can't really grow vegetables and things like that up there in the mountains. The soil is not right for it. Until farming and, and, and farming out on the front range has proven to cause desertification. But the front range is a prairie, so it's not deforestation. The other issue that I have with this is that when you get up into the, these mountain areas, um, a lot of it was timbered a long time ago. And, and when we grew back the forest lands, when you just let it grow back and take over the way that we have, and you don't have these large ungulates and, and ruminants that are you know, keeping the forest floors cleared and things spread out, you end up with unhealthy forests that are overgrown and respirate more CO2 than they actually put in. According to, and then they reference an, a, a, an Oxford study, a plant-based food system would be predicted to emit 75% fewer greenhouse gas emissions, take up to 75% less farmland, cause 66% less biodiversity loss, and use 54% less water as per a recent Oxford study that examined 55,000 people's diets. Meanwhile, Pro Animal Future, the, the group that has put this bill, these bills together, and mind you, they're going after the fur trade as well, in particularly a company that sells um, and, and processes the hides of sheep. But Pro Animal Future, the, the group that is saying, hey, you're not allowed to, to kill an animal and sell it to a consumer so that they could have a highly nutritious meal, but it's completely okay with them to kill an animal for testing. It's right in the bill. So, so this pro-animal rights group has a thing against us eating nutritious, healthy food, but they don't have a problem with companies killing animals for testing. This is a very unusual situation for most animal rights groups. Normally they're against animal testing, but they do not have a problem with companies coming into Denver to do animal testing and killing the animals for testing. They don't have a problem with any of that going on. And that's because of their special interest funding. Now, reading through their bills and their explanations of all of these things, it almost feels like this entire bill is a billboard for patented food products and, and, and alternative proteins. They say the ever-growing abundance of plant-based food options and meat alternatives offer us the ability to transition away from killing animals for food. Denver is already famous for its food truck, the Easy Vegan. Did they pay you well for that, by the way? I hope so, because they're getting a lot of publicity. I'd like a cut of that. That won the 2023's Great Food Truck Race with at least 27 other 
Meet free eateries in Denver Metro with so many options accessible to us, but we're only going to meet, mention that one truck. There's 27 others, but they paid the price to get their name mentioned. We have a chance to, and I don't know if they actually paid them. Maybe it's just like a friend thing. Anyway, they go on to say, we have a chance to build a food system that embodies greater ethics, sustainability, and modernity. A food production, it goes on to say, a food production system that dedicates farmland to directly feeding our population instead of tens of billions of farmed animals is more resource efficient and could help to improve global food security. But like I said, just when you start to think that this is a billboard for patented food products and it's, you know, it's perfectly ethical for these companies, what happened in the state of North Carolina is these companies that were actually developing, the investors who were buying shares of these companies that were developing these alternative proteins, these, all, these investing in things like Beyond Burger and Possible Burger, they were funding the nonprofits that were going after the hog farmers. There's no ethics in a business trying to utilize advocacy groups to change legislation and put their competition out. But I see that here as well, and I haven't done the money trail thing on this. I don't wanna get into all of that. I'm just saying that's what it feels like to me when I read through this. It's a billboard for alternative proteins, and it's a billboard for whoever else wants to pay to have their truck mentioned. If they did that, I don't know if they did. I'm just saying, it, like, it, maybe they're just giving examples of their friend's car. A slaughter-free world could involve rewilding and reforesting giant swaths of land that, were, that had been previously taken over by animal agriculture, increasing the likelihood that we win against climate change and thrive peacefully on this planet for centuries to come. This is about a land grab. Again, it's a land grab for this, from the slaughterhouse to build their inclusive city, and it's a land grab from the farmers to rewild, to republic the land. These people are literally trying to steal from U.S. citizens. They are trying to take away people's rights, and they're doing it in the name of saving their community. You don't save a community by waging economic warfare on farmers. So people wanna know how to help farmers. <clears throat> I started doing this podcast a while back and, and I always discuss legislation and things that I think have a negative impact on farmers. And sometimes it's effective. I don't know if it's something that I said or a video I put out or things that you guys do in response to it. For example, three days after publishing the Oregon video, I heard that Oregon rescinded its CAFO decision. Not entirely, but they're at least not enforcing it. Well, that's, that's good. About four days after I published a video on a girl whose apiaries had been shut down in Wake Forest, North Carolina, Wake Forest rescinded some of their orders as well. Getting the word out is a big part of all of this. There, yes, there are farmer protests. There are farmer protests around Europe, and they seem to be making some headway with getting people to listen to them. But one of the things that I think is the most important is educating people. Because what I see are activists, people who are enthralled with videos that they see and, 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 and things, and they don't understand the entire system. They don't understand the entire process of these animals. They don't, they've never visited a farm. And if they do, they do it with their blinders on. And I don't, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with activists. I think that, you know, activists help keep the industries uh, on the straight and narrow. I think they help cause the industries to constantly look for ways of, of, of improving humane, you know, animal treatment, good husbandry practices. I'm not saying they're a complete waste. What I'm saying is that when you, when you get bills like this and, and you get these things thrown in front of you by these, these types of people, they're manipulating the information to get you to see one side of the story and, and not look at the entire picture. They're using trigger words to make you think of family farmers as industrial farmers, factory farmers. And then they get you riled up. So then you're like, well, yeah, this isn't right. They start saying, well, they're, they, they've been just running in, in, in an EPA violation for three years without it being corrected. That's a false statement altogether. They're causing all this pollution that's here. The pollution was there before they went there. And, it, and like I said, a lot of times when you have situations like that, it's best to at least try and consolidate where the pollution is and, and make sure it's not you know, just spreading across the countryside. There are going to be trade-offs 
to human populations. There are trade-offs to every species on the planet of this earth. Somebody asked me the other day, why do you have to hunt deer? I mean, why can't we just leave nature alone and let them do what they do? I was like, let them go out and, and procreate all, the, all day long? Imagine what would happen to our ecology if the deer population wasn't kept in check. They would destroy it. Every species has an impact. Our species is intelligent enough to manage that impact. We're, we've, been, we've been given the, the intelligence and the wherewithal to process information and, and figure out the best way to do things to help manage the environment. We know that regenerative agriculture, we know that it's important to have these animals on the land doing what they do for the land, creating biodiversity. And we've been given the intelligence to manage that. So anyway, I think one of the most important things we can do is to educate the public and keep people from falling into and, and, and help people see the truth about agriculture, the, how the, the system works, the trade-offs, the, the pros, the cons. I mean, you can't just look at these things and, and constantly give pros out and, and never mention the cons, right? Because there are cons. There's cons to everything. And that's why, you know, what, what my wife and I have done with Meet My Neighbor Productions, which is now, uh, we, we have a separate channel for it, but our nonprofit has basically been dedicated to educate, just simply educating people about agriculture, educating people about sustainability, about regenerative agriculture, and helping people understand how all these parts fit and think holistically. The people who are putting this bill out do not think holistically. Anyway, I should let you guys go, but I hope to have another video out to you soon.